on what's going on in Congress and some things that we've been working on and an update on the committee he sits on. After that, we will take your questions. So you should have filled out a form when you walked in with your question or your issue that you had a concern about. And then we randomly select those out of the bucket. And then you will ask the question. The congressman will answer. And just a reminder, when we're doing that whole process, to be quiet and not clap or talk over the person just so everyone in the room can hear the question that's being asked and the answer that they're receiving. So we're going to start out. I do love. Oh, there it is. We're going to start out with the Pledge of Allegiance. So everyone can stand up, please. Barack Obama was in charge, they closed the national parks, 
which would have, you know, disrupted people's vacations and that sort of thing. I think Donald Trump did what he could to make sure national monuments and national parks remained open so people would not have their vacations ruined. And I was glad he was able to handle things that way. In any event, late on Monday night, a compromise was reached which would keep the government open through next February 8th. And I was so happy it was reached because I was scared to death I wouldn't be able to be here. <laughs> and then I'd have to review with my wonderful staff. But um, we did reach a compromise. We voted on it on Monday night, and I got back late Monday night. And we've, we're now on our second day of, uh, of this um, group of listening sessions. So that's a little bit what happened there. With regard to DACA, I think it's very important that we use this time to change our immigration laws in other ways. Um, I don't think we should have chain. My, our, our goal should be every immigrant is a good immigrant. I don't like the idea of chain immigration where people come here just because they're related to somebody, because you can wind up with people who aren't necessarily a benefit to America. I think we should get rid of diversity lottery. I think we want to do whatever we can to take people from wherever we can who will you know, take our jobs, be hardworking, smart people, law-abiding people, people who aren't taking advantage of government benefits. And if I'm going to vote on something, I, like I said, I want to make sure that the immigration system is fixed. It would be very difficult to fix the immigration under the current Senate rules because I think that is the type of law that would require 60 votes in the Senate to, uh, to finish. If we just would pass the DACA straight away, we'd begin to have the old problems immediately. Right away, again, people would come to this country illegally. Right away, they'd bring their young children. Right away, people would say, we have to let, do something special for the young children, and that would be a problem. Uh, and immigration is a very important issue because we look at the future of America 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the road, where we stand in a country is going to depend on the type of people that we bring in here. I think for too long, presidents of both parties, and there's, you know, you all know I've been very critical of really both President Bushes, but presidents of both parties to, um, felt they would solve the fact that we need more people to work in this country by just letting more and more people in this country illegally and not really. Um, treating our borders seriously. And to me, that sort of, first of all, it's incredibly unfair to the people who are waiting to come here abroad and filling out the forms and doing it legally. And secondly, that idea of getting, I don't know what the exact numbers would be, say we'll get seven good immigrants and three bad immigrants would be a long-term disaster for America. So I'm not for continuing the, I guess what I'll call it the Obama-Bush path of kind of ignoring our immigration laws. But that's what's going on with the government shutdown. I personally do not believe that their overall DACA bill will be passed on February 8th, regardless of what I think. Um, a lot of the focus has been on the Senate and people like Lindsey Graham and what they're saying. Um, in the House, we've had a working group work on a proposed bill. We were briefed on that proposed bill, but we're supposed to have several sessions in which people who weren't on that working group can weigh in ask for changes on the bill, and we've not had those yet. So I, we're not going to be back in Washington until next week, assuming we have two or three private meetings. That leadership has to get together, see if they get 218 votes for a bill, then eventually they have to compromise with the Senate, and eventually they have to have Donald Trump sign on. I can see no way that all that's going to be done by February 8th. I don't even know if we'll have a bill together that we get 218 Republicans to vote for in the House by February 8th. And that doesn't bother me because, like I said, some of these people have been here for 25 years. If we pass a bill in March or April or May instead of February, it's not the end of the world. Uh, I do hope that if we don't wrap things up by February, people do not try to shut down the government again. I think it's completely irresponsible because why should you not be able to get your IRS refunds because of people who are illegally? I mean, that's unrelated to the budget. It's one thing if you're going to vote against the budget because they're spending things in that budget that you don't like, you want to spend more on some things. But it's another thing to say we're going to shut down the government for something that was unrelated to the general spending that goes on in Washington. The next thing I'm going to talk about a little bit is the taxes. Since I last did a series of these town hall meetings, we passed a, a significant tax reform. I'll tell you a little bit about it and the process we went through to get there. Um, on the tax reform, there were really actually four different versions of a bill. The first was something they didn't really care for. Uh, it was something Republicans were supposed to run in the last election. I did not care for it. 
I think it it was aimed too much at what I call the investor class. Um, they started off by doing things like taxing interest income at one half the rate of what people earn by working. Okay, so it kind of created a situation in which if I just inherited a bunch of money, I would pay half the taxes of somebody who was out there working for a living. And I thought that was on the face of a little bit preposterous. We moved from there to a uh, house bill, which was an improvement over the general Republican plan. The, that Then we moved to the Senate. There was a Senate plan, and finally there was a plan that was put together as a compromise between largely the Republicans in the Senate and the Republicans in the House. I was very active throughout uh, putting, to get, putting this together, in part because of my prior life many years ago. I was kind of a small town attorney, and one of the things we do is income taxes. So if you do income taxes for a while, you kind of become opinionated as far as what happens. One area that I, in addition to uh, making sure that as much went for the average guy as possible, I tried to weigh in a little bit more for, for manufacturing, because I think manufacturing is a very important part of the economy. I kind of feel that, you know, your wealth as a country depends upon how much you're making and producing. It doesn't depend on how many law firms you have. So I um, kind of weighed in for manufacturing. I also weighed very uh, strongly to make sure we kept the medical and dental uh, deduction. Um, some Republicans felt we shouldn't keep the medical deduction because they wanted to simplify the return. They figured, they figured the more lines off the return, the better it was. And quite frankly, they said not a lot of people get the medical deduction. To me, that's true, except the medical, the people who use the medical deduction need it. I mean, you're not going to get, a, given that it's subject to a 10% limit, you're not going to get the medical deduction if you have, you know, $800 a year in medical expenses. People who use the medical deduction are people in nursing homes, people who don't have health insurance and have a large surgery, people who have huge health insurance bills. And people like that are people who really need the deduction. I think to take away the deduction just shows that like some of the people who put together the plans before that don't realize that sometimes the average person has to go through or not that familiar with what's going on in the income taxes. In any event, we finally did wrap up the income tax. I wish we had a little bit more time to look at the final package. I mean, given the fact that we had four different uh, versions of the bill, it gave us time to look at it. But both the time we voted in the House on the House bill and the compromise bill between the House and the Senate, there wasn't a huge amount of time to have uh, for input or to change things. It has been implied to us that we are going to have a bill dealing with any errors in that bill passed sometime in the next six months. I don't know if that's true or not, but obviously income taxes affect everybody differently. I know how complicated they are, and if anybody in the audience, tax preparer tells you something, please contact me because I do plan on weighing in, on, weighing in on, the, on the final bill as well or the bill dealing with any problems in the original bill. The next bill will almost certainly be a bill that will have to be bipartisan so any changes will have to be relatively technical in nature, but I'm sure we will find changes that have to be made because even on less complicated tax bills they make mistakes. Taxes are so incredibly complicated. Um, as far as other things that are going on in Washington right now, we are working on both last year's budget and next year's budget. Uh, as far as last year's budget, I have a feeling we're going to be very disappointed on the amount of money that's spent. We right now um, do have problems in our military. If you have any children or grandchildren in the military, you ask them, they'll tell you that there are planes we have that can't fly for lack of parts, tanks that can't run for lack of parts. And as a result, there was going to be an increase in military spending. Donald Trump proposed about a 5.5% increase in military spending. There were, I'm guessing, 40, maybe 50 Republican congressmen who told leadership, including Paul Ryan, they weren't going to vote to fund the government unless they got a substantial increase in military spending, maybe something over 10%. We eventually reached a compromise around 8.5%. And as a result, the position coming out of the House will be an increase in military spending of over 8%. I don't think quite that much is necessary. I think they're wasting money in the military. They are going through an audit right now. I introduced an amendment to reduce that final amount, still a big increase, but reduce it by 1%. Um, that amendment was not brought up, but I was one of the few Republicans who felt, you know, 
if we settle in around a 7% increase, that's enough. We don't have to go above that. Um, the problem is, ultimately, when we do fund the government, it will have to be bipartisan in nature. And in some ways, it's very good that things are bipartisan. But uh, a lot of times, bipartisan means you keep spending more money to keep everybody happy. And I'm afraid to get 60 votes in the Senate. Some Democrats will be willing to sign off for a substantial increase in military spending, but they'll say there's going to be a big increase in military spending, we need a big increase in non-military spending as well. Donald Trump proposed a cut in non-military spending. Um, the House came up with a relatively small cut. Um, I have a feeling Chuck Schumer, who will be doing some of the negotiating for the Democrats, will ask a big increase in non-military spending as well. And at a time when we are so in debt, I think it's irresponsible to have a, a budget going up by 7 or 8 percent or 6 or 7 percent. And I'm afraid that's where we're going to wind up. Like I said, despite the fact we're three and a half years into the year, they're working on a new, um, a new agreement with budget caps. And I'm told the people doing the negotiating with the Senate have not really even started doing those negotiations because they're waiting for those numbers to be completed first. Um, Otherwise, on the budget, I think something that's very significant but has not been dealt with is once a year, I mentioned that in the Senate you need 60 votes to pass something. Once a year, you can do things in the Senate with 51 votes. It is restricted to only certain topics, either what they call mandatory spending, um, debt, or taxes. In this two-year period between the elections, I thought we would have three opportunities to do things because we were kind of had really completed things for the 2016 budget. So I thought we were going to have one thing to pass the Senate with 51 votes for 2016 left over, one for 2017, and one for 2018. In 2016, we tried to uh, get rid of Obamacare. You're aware if you read the paper that it was something we need 51 votes to try to repeal in the Senate. There were a couple senators who voted against it, three senators who voted against it. So our effort to use the what they call the reconciliation process to get something done with 50 votes in the Senate for 2016 failed. For 2017, we dealt with the income taxes, and you recall the tax cut passed with 51 votes, so that's what we were able to use the 51 vote for there. I had hoped we were going to use 2018 to do some sort of welfare reform. As a matter of fact, I think welfare reform is even more important than the tax cut. Um, the tax cut is good for our economy. We could not, you know, go along with a, um, a corporate rate of 35% when the rest of the world was sitting there at 20, 15%. I think even President Obama realized or talked about cutting the corporate rate. Um, but the, the welfare system just, you know, I think eats away at the moral fiber of the country. I think that's the more important of the two. Um, for short periods of time, I thought we were going to deal with welfare in 2017, but I didn't win that fight. However, both Donald Trump and Paul Ryan have said they are for dealing with welfare in 2018. There are rumors in Washington that the Republicans in the Senate <coughs> do not want to take advantage of the ability <coughs> to uh, do anything with 51 votes in 2018. And if that is true, that is legislative malpractice. When you think how hard it is to become a U.S. Senator and to campaign all over the state and then say we're not going to do anything that's particularly controversial in 2018, it's, it's just absurd. Um, I have talked to a few senators about it. We are going to have a joint retreat when I get back next week, and I will weigh in very forcefully with the other senators. At that time, I am on the budget committee that is supposed to reach a deal on what they call reconciliation. And uh, I know Ron Johnson would love to do things with 51 votes, but apparently Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, does not want to. Um, that's, like I said, I think we have to apply public pressure to do something, because when you really can only pass one significant piece of legislation a year, or at least a significant piece of legislation with 51 votes, you better take advantage of it. Um, I think with regard to the welfare situation, we are right now discouraging people from working. I think there's a lot of evidence out there of people who are either not working at all or working only a little bit because they don't want to lose their government benefits. I think it's important for the moral fiber of society that people work. 
The second problem is a lot of these benefits, you would be ineligible for the benefits if you were married to somebody with a decent income. So the benefits also uh, discourage marriage and discourage what we used to call intact families, and that's another big problem. There are a variety of things we could do that I think the vast majority of people in the public would agree on. I think there should be time limits on some of these welfare programs, be they low-income housing, be it food share or whatever. These programs were designed to help people through tough times. They weren't designed to help people for 10 or 15 years. The next thing we can do is put work requirements in there. If jobs are available, people should take the jobs. In other states where they put work requirements on things like food share, it's amazing the number of people who peeled off of the programs and all of a sudden didn't need them. The final thing I think they could look at is drug testing. I mean, <clears throat> right now there are businesses who tell us they can't find people and one reason they can't find people is they have a hard time finding people who pass the drug test. If you cannot get a working job because you can't pass a drug test, why in the world should you be able to get a government check or government benefits? And I think if we do these things, we'll kind of move America back on the path um, where you have less and less people living what I'll refer to as the welfare lifestyle. So that's kind of what's going on in the Budget Committee. I am also on two other committees, the Government Oversight Committee, which deals with government scandals. We have a variety of hearings on that. Um, previously, when I was first on that committee, my chairman was a guy by the name of Jason Chaffetz from Utah. If you're a C-SPAN sort of person, you maybe remember him. I had the most active committee. However, he decided to quit last year, opportunity to make some more money, and uh, <coughs> be home at night. So he decided to leave that job. There was a while before we, uh, our new committee chairman got up and going. We had met with him, and hopefully we'll be back on a more aggressive path soon. There's certainly no shortage of scandals in the government for us to deal with. Um, but the other committee I'm on is the Education and Workforce Committee. We also have a new committee chairman there. Our new committee chairman is a woman by the name of Virginia Fox from North Carolina. She was administrator for Appalachian State College in North Carolina, not surprising. Well, there are a lot of things she could take up. She's focusing on higher education. My goal in higher education is twofold. First of all, um, I think we do not want so many kids going so far in debt. I mean, you can find people, you know, married people, who are between them over $100,000 in debt in their 30s. Very difficult to buy a house, very difficult to start a family. It's really a scandal that things have gotten out of line that much. Um, so there are a few things we can do in the future. First of all, we're going to require a little more counseling on the part of the colleges, some of the colleges feel, and this is something that was true when I went to school many years ago, sometimes people take out student loans, not necessarily for tuition and books, but sometimes for enhanced lifestyle. It's a lot easier to take out uh, a bigger loan when you're 20 years old and you feel it's going to be years and years before you have to pay it off than it is actually to pay off the loan. Uh, we're also going to sanction educational institutions in which too many of the kids are not repaying the loans. Because to me, a little bit of that fault should come on, on the colleges and universities, right? And if a lot of people are not paying the loans, we should be putting pressure on the colleges and universities to encourage kids to go into fields where they can get a job. We should put pressure on them not to accept kids who probably won't graduate anyway because, you know, we don't want kids taking out student loans and then dropping out two years later. Um, but the final thing we want to do is we want to uh, aim for it, or we want to encourage them to set up internships and that type of thing where it's easier to get a job. And overall, I would like to see more kids go into what I'll call skills-based education. Okay, it's hard not to argue right now. We have a lot of people getting a four-year degree. You wind up following them. They wind up going back to a tech school later or a trade school later. If they had done that first, they'd be making a lot of money in the first place. We as a society have a shortage of people. We need to do the skilled jobs in manufacturing. We have a shortage of people in construction. Okay. And you talk to people in the trade schools, they not only more people to go in there, but a lot of the people who are doing the jobs right now are older. They're in their 50s and 60s. They're going to retire soon. And these are the most important jobs we have in our society. Again, our wealth as a society doesn't depend on how many lawyers we have. It depends upon how much we're making. 
which means construction and manufacturing. And we need more people in those areas. And like I said, people in those areas can frequently make a lot more money than a lot of people with college degrees. So in any event, those are going to be my goals. On the Higher Education Committee, we did pass a bill out of committee. I expect it to be on the floor sometime in the next six or eight weeks. Um, that in general is what's going on. <coughs> Try what else I should comment on. Sometimes people ask me about Donald Trump. Um, I, uh, I think overall, very good things as far as government regulation is concerned. I think the fact that the economy is doing so well, um, a lot of that comes from what he's done. I do feel that sometimes he tweets too much. I've only really had like a two minute conversation with him once he got elected and uh, tried to emphasize to him that this was not being helpful. I think uh, it hurts his popularity for one thing. I think he'd be able to do a better job of getting his uh, program paid. If he was more popular, your popularity gets under 40%. And you know, some congressmen might take shots that you would vote against you because it's the, the easy thing to do. I think also it kind of maybe hurts us abroad a little bit, you know, a little bit unprofessional. And um, I, I will, like I said, I, know, I talked to him for about two minutes and uh, I did not succeed. But I'm collecting anecdotes and maybe eventually I'll get another two minutes. You know, people sometimes say, do you tell Trump this, do you tell Trump that? I've had several situations in which I'm in the room with him, I get to shake his hand. But it's really hard with 435 congressmen to get, you know, 15 minutes alone with the president. Maybe it'll happen someday. Um, but that's a little bit with what's going on. Does anybody have, now we're going to open up for questions. Is Rachel around here with the question box? What color is that? Which color? Lavender. Your, lavender. That's what I thought. I was going to say it's lavender. Um, the cards are all in the bucket. <coughs> Oh, I should introduce Camille Solberg. Camille Solberg is here from Senator Johnson's office. Hi. Say hi, why don't you stand and wave to the wall. Hello everybody, I'm actually the regional director for this county as well, so it's great to be here and to hear what he has to say and to hear what you have to say because I'm taking this back now. So thanks again for being here. Right, and if I screw it up, Senator Johnson will get it right. So <laughs> <laughs> Our first one is Lou Basic, Boston. Good. Um, I'm a um, resident in your northern district up in Appleton, Fox County. And of course, our committee, we got together and met with you regarding climate issues. I'm a uh, member of the Citizens Climate Lobby. Okay. So we uh, dialogued with you uh, sometime ago, and I think our, our group had um, another meeting with you a couple weeks ago. I have talked to you, and I, we met in my, my final life office, right? In your final life office, yes. So um, I was I was really, um, well, I, I'd say shocked that when Trump came out with his uh, national security policy, he not a phrase about climate issues affecting the United States and the world. So I'm wondering if you had more of an opportunity to uh, look at that issue because uh, it is, you know, we talk about all these other issues, but if we ruin the world that we live in, you know, what else is there? Well, and, um, <laughs> as you know, um, there are hot and cold uh, years, hot and cold decades, hot and cold centuries. Um, and as I think I told you when I was in my office, um, when I was younger, I remember in the 1970s, there were smart people who talked about global cool. Or whatever headlines. Things are going to be so cold. We're not going to be able to grow wheat in, in uh, Canada, and, you know. And their predictions, despite the fact that they were presumably smart people with PhDs, didn't come true. Um, and even more recently, on the people who felt global warming was going on, now they change it from global warming to more climate change. They made a lot of predictions in 1997, the year 2000, as to how hot the world would be today. And a lot of those changes have not come to fruition. And maybe they will come to fruition someday. Well, they are coming to fruition. There's a lot of evidence that there's something going on. Okay, but, but I mean, if you looked at their predictions of where the world temperatures would be, the predictions they made in 1997, 
and where we are today, they didn't necessarily wind up uh, where they thought they'd wind up. Um, I always love reading your stuff because it's very important to be right. But I think uh, in, anything we do would, first of all, impinge on people's freedom and secondly, very expensive. We have overall in this country done a lot with pollution, right? I mean, you look at the particulate matter, you look at the ozone, you look at our, our, our lakes and streams compared to when I was growing up, and you know, things are, are much cleaner than they used to be. Um, okay, so why are people like up in northern Wisconsin, there's evidence that our the national forests are being affected by climate issues? Uh, the Audubon Society is very concerned about the de decrease in bird populations mm -hmm. in our human environment. So there's, there's a hell of a lot of evidence. Plus, the other evidence is that as a society, we are getting sicker. Uh, you, in, your, in your last meeting with our group, you wanted evidence of... Um, uh, I, I don't know what's causing it, but we sometimes talk about, I think in some ways people are getting sicker. People have more allergies than they used to, and uh, we're doing some research on that. Well, if your staff wants a doctor here locally that'll talk to your staff about it, I can supply you. We'd love to talk to him. Is it him or her? Uh, I think it's a young. It's yeah. a young. Okay. But I can okay. give that to you. Good, good, good. But uh, well, thank you for your response. Sure. Oh, oh, thanks for showing up here. Earl Dagner. Okay, you just check in. Okay, good. Thanks for showing up. <laughs> Kurt Wilkins? Yeah, that's me. Okay. Um, I actually have two questions. Um, one is I disagree a little bit about the DACA and your opinion of it. Okay. I think that the people are not concerned about new people bringing their children into the country. I think people are only concerned about the, the children that were brought here and that have been living here their whole lives of which there are, I don't know, 800,000 or something like that. Right here in Wisconsin, there are 7,600. Um, if those people were to leave, according to the US, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, it would take out $427 million out of our GDP. Okay, so why would, would this want to happen? And, and, and just the nature of the program itself, it's a deferment program. Now, in looking at what has just happened in the past few weeks with Haiti and the people from El Salvador that were brought here and were allowed to be here for humanitarian reasons, now they're all being sent back. If this program is not renewed, what is going to guarantee that these people won't just start being sent back? You know, the um, foreign agreement comes. <coughs> You know, I don't think there's. I don't think people are concerned about new immigrants sneaking in. I don't think there are as many as there have been in the past. And this is a deferment program for the kids that grew up. Right. I think when I talked about in the future, I was saying this. In the past, presidents of both parties have not taken our immigration laws seriously, and that includes George Bush. And I think one of the reasons they didn't take our immigration laws seriously, particularly bushes is they realized we need some new immigrants in this country but rather than getting those new immigrants there by picking the best we could find they just said well let's let a bunch of people sneak across the border and a lot of them will be good and it's true a lot of them are good but a lot of them will be bad too it seems like kind of a ridiculous way to get more immigrants here but this um, is a program right. that's just a deferment right 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 the people that are already here i mean right. they, they might they don't even have any work done right but if we just say, let's let these people stay here, first of all, some of them are people we wouldn't want here, but even more, now is the time where we have to straighten out the immigration laws going forward. If we just do as some people want us to do, let's make the uh, DACA a permanent thing in statute, okay, then right away tomorrow, this, the same problem will begin to creep up with new people, right? Because we'll continue to have people but the, come the, here. The other thing I have here is the DACA people, have to register right. and have approval to stay here. So you're just making the statement some of these are people that we don't want here. Well, that's fine. Nobody's going to argue with that. You know, right. I mean, then they shouldn't be in the program. 
but if they're legitimate, good people for the for our economy and our world. And another thing in Wisconsin, with the 7,600 young people, we've got a big problem here in the state with not having enough young people and not bringing enough new kids into the state. Right, and, and, and we have to make sure, like I said, all the new people of here are, are good people. I will grant you for the good of the economy, and not to mention just humanitarian persons, for reasons we're going to have to get more immigrants here. And traditionally, the immigrants in this country have been a big, a, a, um, a big um, asset to the economy, an asset to us. But like I said, those people should be picked, not across the, across the board. And now is the time to straighten out the law otherwise. If we don't straighten out the law, now when are we going to straighten out the law? We can't just say we want all these people in here and start from scratch. Because believe it or not, the same sort of people who think like George Bush or Barack Obama are in powerful positions, and they'll just start letting the next wave of immigrants. I don't think this is about the next wave. These yeah. are the people yeah. that have nowhere to go. And my second question is, and this kind of relates to the chip thing, but indirectly. Um, it's my understanding that there's a, a, a fund called the Community Health Center Fund, which um, provides 70% of funding for 2,800 community health centers in the U.S. And they service about $27 million uh, mm -hmm. to people, a lot of them being chip recipients. Right. Now, the funding has not been continued for that. So it's nice to see where the chip program has gone. But you know, what about the funding for the local clinics and stuff like that, where a lot of these chip people might go? Or um, we will wait and see what happens in this budget. Like I said, the works, kind of, um, I would be surprised if there was a reduction in that program by the time this budget is done. But we will see. I'll take it into account. Like I said, I don't think there's going to be. I would be very surprised if there's a reduction in non-defense. Well, it's just something we yeah, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll get it. We'll get it. And, I, I, yeah, and I, I realize community health centers are, are largely funded by the federal government. I'd be surprised if there's a reduction. Thank you. Mary Giffen? Thank you. 
I've never heard of anybody doing that uh, to a, a United States president. And that's a, that's a disrespect for people overseas, I feel. And the harm that uh, the, all the promotion he's causing in this country with his tweeting and his mouth and everything. Yep. Don't you think there should be huh. some avenue to change presidents? Um, I mean, you'll still have a Republican. Well, it's called elections, but um, right now our economy is doing pretty well. And I realize the economy wasn't bad when Donald Trump took over, but things are getting better and better. And part of that is, I think, the certainty on the regulatory situation from his cabinet appointees. Some of it was the anticipation of the tax cut, and some of it was the tax cut. And, uh, and you may think things are, are bad in this country, but there are no shortage of people from all around the world that want to come in here. You know, one thing I like to do, and it's a, um, when you're in Washington, there are a lot of people who were not born in this country, a lot of immigrants, far more immigrants in, in the Washington, D.C. area than here. And if I have a chance to talk to them at the airport, um, in the service industry, a lot of them maybe wind up even working in security uh, around, the, around the Capitol. I, I like to ask them the differences between their home country and the United States. And they will always tell you that America is the land of opportunity. And that's, I always like to ask them what's the best thing about America and the worst thing about America when they talk to their relatives back home. And again and again, they're making it. They're buying houses. They're working hard. But they talk about America being the land of opportunity. And um, there are always people who aren't going to like America kind of for what we are, but I'll tell you, I, I should get the statistics. I know they're available. We can look for the statistics. The number of people are trying to get here from every country around the world. So people are going to complain about us for a variety of reasons, but I bet all around the world, there are a lot of people who wish they were American. All right, I got the right name. I'm sorry to Marv. Go ahead, Marv. Oh. <laughs> No matter where you go these days, there's so many issues that come up, regardless of where you're talking and who you're talking to, it always ends up politics. That never used to happen. One of the biggest issues is uh, the health care. What, why do we, as working people, have to fight and live and work just for insurance? Congress gets everything handed to them. And they're sit, they sit there bickering every day and get nothing done. Um, as you know, I voted for two different plans to replace Obamacare. As far as our insurance and my staff's insurance as well, um, they decided what our insurance will be before I got there. Uh, my insurance is a $5,000 deductible, and they take like 520 bucks a month out of my paycheck for it. Um, it is through the District of Columbia Exchange, so in that regard, I get Obamacare, uh, and it's inferior insurance to what other federal employees get. Uh, it's very difficult to come up with a replacement of Obamacare. I think you saw it in the Senate. We felt one, sh one vote short of keeping the chance for a change alive. Um, I think there was a plan that Patty Murray and Lamar Alexander are working on in the Senate. I wish I could tell you that we will have a whole new superior plan soon. I don't think that's going to happen, but I think what's going to happen is we're going to be presenting something to vote on in April or May to kind of muddle through for another couple of years like we have in the past. Hopefully I'm wrong, but that's my guess will happen because it's a very difficult, uh, a very difficult topic to deal with. I think overall, when you're dealing with any of this healthcare things, the only problem is cost. I don't care whether you're talking about a business you're talking about an individual looking for health insurance, or you're talking to people in government trying to provide health insurance for their employees. It's just been dominating people's budgets. Um, I think individual businesses with, say, over 500 employees, if they're forward-looking, forward have kind of got a handle on their health care costs. Um, and they do it through things that is, are more difficult for small businesses to duplicate and difficult to duplicate on a larger scale. But, you know, if you have to have some buy-in um, for the individual employees as far as monitoring how much they're spending, you need to provide information 
as far as the difference in cost for similar things from one clinic to the other clinic. You have to have a situation in which medical providers are not incentivized to do more or send people to specialists unnecessarily. And I think if you do things, those things together, you can get a handle on overall costs. I have been told with regard to Medicare that um, there is less being spent per person in Wisconsin than other places like New York and Florida. And it's been referred to be one of those reasons is in other states they like to do more tests and even more surgeries. Because of course there's more money to be made there. So it would be good nationwide if we could kind of duplicate the, I guess I'll say more efficient or ethical practicing of medicine we have in Wisconsin and other places. Uh, however, I, I say reluctantly, and I voted for two plans, I say reluctantly, I don't think there's going to be a widespread health care reform that's going to pass Congress in the next 10 months. Well, then there's the, so many people, elderly people, working just to pay taxes and insurance. And right. they have nothing left after that. That is a huge, huge issue. It is a huge issue. I'll grant you. Marcel and Marion Hildebrandt. I think we covered them. Okay. Do we have other questions? Okay. Richard Woolman? No, I passed it. Okay. Carol Kinnears? Hi. Okay. I was wondering if anybody in the federal legislature has considered a civil asset forfeiture bill. Now, Senator Craig in Wisconsin has one, but they don't want to take it up. New Mexico and California legislatures passed the amendments. There is a bill out there. I do not know. I, I don't know what to grab with Okay, why not? Well, I just didn't understand. Okay, you can explain a little bit about what they're doing. Civil asset forfeiture okay. is uh, something that law enforcement or government can come and impound your savings or things that have monetary value without charging you for anything and tie that money up indefinitely. And even if you are found to be not in violation of anything, it can take months for you to get your property or your money back. Mm -hmm. So California legislature passed a unanimous bill that stated that this cannot be done anymore, that you have to be charged with something before they can take home your savings yes. or whatever. Okay, thank you. I just yeah, never passed it unanimously. Right. The governor was opposed to it. She didn't have a choice because it was unanimous. Same in California. Good. But there are a lot of municipalities that figure this into their budgets that there's going to be a certain amount of money that comes from civil asset forfeiture. There is a bill out there. We I've talked about it with a buddy of mine um, from Alabama. The bill is in committee, and I think Judiciary Committee, and I will check with uh, Congressman Goodlatte from Virginia and let you know how quickly that's going to move. I would like to see it fly through the Senate. A problem we have is it's so difficult to get things through there because not as it takes 60 votes, but one senator can put a hold on things. And I can imagine, particularly with regard to law enforcement, some people will say it's built our budgets, but you're absolutely right. It's a horrible thing because it encourages Government is aggressive enough as it is on their own. And if by being aggressive they get more money to fund government, it, it's even worse. And what's even worse is sometimes you don't even know how they figure out if you've got this money. There was, um, the Heritage Foundation has a website. And they looked at it a lot. A young man had saved like $14,000 to go to California to pursue his career in the music industry. They took his money while he was on the train. How they find out, you know, that you even have this cash on you, you know, so it's kind of a... So what I'll do, Congress will do. Right. Right. We'll check with, we'll check with Congress for the lead and see where the property is moving. Lisa Siri? I was just wondering, with all the budget cuts being done in the federal government, why is there still the government being shut down? Um, first of all, they're not that many budget, with budget cuts. But um, the way it works, on a state level, and maybe it would be better if we had it on a state level, on a state level, if they don't finish last year's budget, you don't notice it because they just keep spending the way they did the prior year. And that's what happened a year ago. They have a two-year budget, 
in the state, but if they don't finish it, you don't notice it. On a federal level, to just keep paying anybody, you have to appropriate the funds. And every year, the amount we did for the prior year runs out on September 30th. So what we do is we do through continuing resolutions, kind of, we'll keep spending for another month or two months or three weeks or whatever, the amount we spent the prior year while we negotiate what that year's budget is. And that's what's going on now. And we'll run out of money again on February 8th because Congress only passed a bill to fund the government through February 8th. Maybe on February 7th, we'll fund the government for another three weeks while they keep talking about what they're going to do this, this, uh, this current year. But that, that's the way it works. Congress always has to appropriate funds before they can be spent. So how come they don't have to set a budget budget like, like we do? Well, we do have a budget. <laughs> 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 right. um, we only fund it for 60 days or well, eventually they fund it through September 30th, okay? And if things were done correctly, we would have a budget done by September 30th. It would be on the president's desk. It would be signed, and we know exactly how much we're funding for the next 12 months. In this case, and I, the Senate has a, a very difficult job, in this case, the House that I am a part of passed a budget that would have funded the government from October October 1st towards next September 30th. The Senate has not done that, I think in part because they need 60 out of 100 votes. So ultimately what will happen is there will be a negotiation between people in the House and Paul Ryan, despite the fact he's the Speaker, pushes a lot of this responsibility on other congressmen. So the people who negotiate on behalf of the House will be the chairman of something called the Appropriations Committee, a guy from New Jersey, and 12 subcommittee chairs under him, and somebody's going to negotiate on behalf of the Senate, and uh, a compromise will be reached, maybe March, I'm guessing, that's kind of ridiculously late, but it will be. But in the interim, <coughs> there is kind of a budget in the sense that we just passed a budget for another three weeks, you know, but ultimately we're going to pass a budget They'll go through September 30th. This is exactly the amount that the federal government can spend. I should point out that about 70% of what the federal government spends is what they call mandatory spending. And that goes on because it's considered an obligation of the federal government, even, even if we don't pass a separate bill on that every year. For example, Social Security or Medicaid or Medicare is an obligation of the federal government. And even if we don't pass a budget, those funds keep being spent or checked continue to be issued. When we vote on our budget, it's only like the remaining 30% of, of what the federal government spends. Dean, Dean Lent, we're asking questions in the order that I draw them yeah. so that it's well, fair for everyone in the crowd. Yeah, I'm not going to spread out. You have a chance to ask me something before we're done. You take grab quickly. Dean? Dean Lent? Congressman, you've held a lot of town halls and right. listened to a lot of people. Uh, after listening to the issues of all the people, uh, have you changed your opinion on anything? Um, sure. I, I think it's always good to hear from, from people, particularly if they have um, particularly experience in given matters. And um, and of course, some of it's the town hall, some of it's when I have meetings in my office in Fond du Lac, and some of it's just when I get out around the district and talk to people. But um, I think um, on some issues regarding uh, diseases, research on diseases, um, I'm more sympathetic towards more spending money there than I was originally. I think on some mental health issues, I may have changed my mind on some issues when you talk to people. But it's always good to get out and about, listen to people, and um, write an amendment on, on military spending. I mean, like I said, I'm still not a fanatic. Uh, I, I did, you know, author an amendment to reduce military spending by 1% from the new, the new budget that's up there, but um, I'm willing to say that we need an increase in defense spending after talking to people in the military. So it's not unusual at all for me to change my opinion. Just as it would be your opinion. I mean, 
in, in government, you're expected to have opinion on so many, many different things. Government touches, quite frankly, far too many things. But because it affects so many different things, I have changed my mind on things. Justine Bond. Sir, will you work to be authorized the voting rights act? Um, I don't think it's coming up any time in the near future. We haven't even looked at it yet, to be honest. Rebecca Reinhardt? I have concern about um, people volunteering. I think there should be a law that the matter of businesses community or government uh, I'd love to volunteer to go to prisoners could I know all the things I've gone through in my own life overcoming seven handy caps and I'd like to encourage motivate and uplift individuals what your problem in life what you want to be written from and just kind of do a nice coaching fun talk. I'll still let them do the majority of the talk. Well, I am glad that you like to volunteer to help people, and it sounds like you have a lot of experiences in your life that other people can learn from. And, um, you know, we'll see if there are opportunities available from you. Do they have a local like, volunteer center here? In Winnebago County, and a lot of counties have that. Um, do they have that? I'm not getting my apple Okay. And I'm here in Ottawa County. Right. I think I brought this issue up before, and I, the last time you had come to the meeting, that I just gave this three and a half page type paper. I okay, what I'll do is I'll, I'll talk to my staff. And we can see if there's anybody who you could talk to or maybe help people out with. Maybe we can talk to the county. And uh, I'll talk to my staff and maybe we can find if there are opportunities for you because it sounds like you've had a lot of good experiences in life that other people can learn from. Yeah, so I want to pass this stuff on. And it just bothers me that I haven't found a way of doing that yet. How's this wall going? There ain't no money there. Don't you realize? Could you say a little bit about that? Well, I think part of the negotiation with regard to DACA is make sure the borders are secure, and part of making borders secure is making sure a wall gets built. And I'd be surprised if they don't reach a compromise on that without more money being available to build the wall. Linda Yilsman? Hi. Um, I was glad to hear that you're on the Education and Workforce Committee. I'm very concerned about education issues. Um, there are two related ones that I'm hoping you'll consider. There's an E-rate program that is Federal Universal Service Program for Internet. And I was reading that they might be changing the way the funding is distributed versus considering cost of service. They might be doing a per pupil, more mm -hmm. of a sum that way. And I think that that will hurt rural districts and districts with declining enrollment. So I'm encouraging that they would go with the other okay. method. And then the other one just to finish off so you can talk. Um, also, I would just like to encourage you to um, reinstate net neutrality because a lot of schools who are trying to achieve cost savings are using online resources to help decrease their costs. Okay. Um, on the first issue, I'd like to talk to some of my staff. I am going to be meeting, or at least it was canceled once, but I think I'm going to be Betsy DeVos sometime within the next month. And I will weigh in 
if, if I feel the state of Wisconsin is getting the shorter of the stick on this change, I'll weigh in. So if you could maybe talk to one of my staff before we leave here later today, um, I can weigh in on that. And on, on net neutrality, um, I agree with the President right now. I think in the past, uh, things worked, worked well. There weren't any problems under the old system. Um, we can always change things in the future. But in general, I think I'm for less government regulation in that area. Fred Bond. Uh, <clears throat> I have two questions. Uh, one thing, this, this goes back to Ron Reagan. He put in place that if a senator or congressman was elected for two or more terms, I think it is, they leave with a retirement package. Uh, they can save money there if they get rid of that. Um, the other thing is the new package, the new in the new uh, tax thing. You said that there might be uh, changes made to that. Right, right. I know. Are they're they're going to to increase? It. They they took away mortgage payments. They took away state funds. They took away city funds for, for uh, property. Um, now, that is supposed to <coughs> expire, I don't know how, how many years, it's now 10, 15, whatever. But so you don't get those things back, do you, when it, when it expires? You're just <coughs> floating out in no man's land somewhere? I, I think. I think you've got a couple concerns there. We brought back the deduction for state mobile income, state mobile income and property taxes up to ten thousand um, dollars. As I mentioned, the people who are going to be disproportionately affected by the camp are the wealthier people, and some of them are mad about that and are mad about it in higher tax states than Wisconsin. Um, I think you're talking about the fact that the personal income tax cut changes are going to expire. I talked about the rules in the Senate before, and if it weren't for the rules in the Senate, those would have been made permanent. However, historically, income tax changes that affect the average person are extended. You will recall when George Bush had his income taxes, uh, his income tax cuts, even though the Democrats were a little bit more reluctant to cut taxes than Republicans. Um, even the Democrats and Barack Obama, when they held both the House and the Senate, they extended the Bush personal income tax cuts to all but the very wealthy. So I would expect that the current personal income tax cuts will remain. Uh, your other question was, as far as my pension, uh, right now, there's something out on the internet that's just not true, but so many people see it. Um, my pension is figured the same way as other federal employees. I don't think it used to be that way. I think they reduced legislative um, pensions for people elected after 2012 or after 2010. But right now, my pension is the same as other federal employees. It's 1% of your salary times your service, and you have to be there five years before you're vested. Do you want to tell them about the Oh yeah, the mortgage, right, but you still, uh, you still will able to get the mortgage interest deduction on your mortgage. You get a mortgage interest deduction uh, up to $750,000 house. That's another example of, you know, we try to help the average guy. Obviously, there are a few people out there have houses worth more than 750000 not that many, and some of those people are going to be able to complain because they don't get their deduction on the amount over $750,000, but we try to aim the tax cut of the average guy or even wealthier than average up to 750000 But there are houses worth more than that. Um, and that's why, again, a lot of the Republican congressmen from California, New York, New Jersey, where wealthy houses like that are more common, voted against the ventilator from their wealthy constituents and said, why don't I get a deduction on my million dollar mortgage? All right, we're about 20 minutes over, Glenn. Do you want to take 20 minutes over? Yeah, do you want to take one more? Time flies. <laughs> we can. We're with. Two more. Right. Okay. Penny Powell. Yeah, that's me. Um, you talked about uh, the drug testing for 
federal um, benefits, right. and they're talking about it at the state level too. And I just want everybody to know that just about every Democrat that's running for governor against Walker endorses marijuana legalization. And this is going to be the, probably the trend going down the road. I, for the life of me, cannot figure out why they include marijuana testing in a drug test. And it's a Schedule One drug along with heroin, and cocaine is a Schedule Two. I mean, marijuana stays in your system for quite a long time. So you could have smoked a joint a month ago, but if you take your physical for your uh, job test, you're disqualified. But that's actually not my question that I was going to ask you, but you wanted a response to comments and with, from experienced people, and I have experience. I mean, I smoked in the past many years ago, and I just, I don't feel that marijuana is the uh, it, it horrific should. problem in a work environment that methamphetamines, uh, Oxycontin, you know, addictive drugs, heroin are. That's not my question. Okay. Should I go on? Go ahead. Go ahead. I, by the way, I don't think it should be a, a top tier drug. Yeah, okay. Right. Thank you. Um, I have heard you say a couple of times on public radio that uh, nobody's talking about the Russian interference in the 2016 election. Mm -hmm. um, You're going to change it right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm here to talk about it. But I, I just want to know what are you and what is the government doing? Um, I assume when they are done doing all their investigating, there'll be some legislation addressing the situation. Richard Schrader? Richard Schrader? Thanks for being here. 